Well, welcome everybody. We're very excited to um, have this thought leadership session with Gail. What an honor to get the 2019 AONE Lifetime Achievement Award. And you just retired in October? Yes. So Gail retired in October, last day was a Friday. On Monday, she was working as a consultant for Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh. So she really had a nice break for a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. She was out there. So, you know, a Lifetime Achievement Award makes you think that you're looking back on your career like you're done. You're not done. Just like I said in the interview this morning, or the video this morning, you know, nursing's not finished with you and you're not finished with nursing. But I think to talk to our um, uh, AONE members here today, it's a real treat for them to hear from you about sort of your nuggets. And I'm just going to ask you a few questions, and I'd like to make this organic as, po as organic as possible. So even though this award honors you for all the work that you've done your, in your career, and you've been from bedside to leadership to board member at trustee to consultant, you know, all of that didn't happen overnight, and that you know. So if you were to give this audience maybe one word of how you would describe your journey that moved you along all of those tracks, what would that word be and why? Interesting, Claire, <laughs> because um, the word I'm going to use is the wor word of resilience. And I know you might sit back and say, well, wow, resilience is how you handle difficult situations and how you bounce back from that difficult situation, but I also look at resilience as how you bounce back from success also. So I, I have a rule um, that when something doesn't go well, and I'll be very honest with you, we all know it does not go well no matter what role, what position you're in, whether it be in a home situation or in your professional life, bumps occur and sometimes those bumps are mountains just like Everest. And when that occurs, I sit back and just, um, well, the first thing I'd like to say is my father taught me there's no crying in baseball. So when I'm in my professional role, the tears do not come down thy face, you know, and you can bite your tongue or whatever. But I also take time for myself and usually try to take about five minutes to quickly feel what I need to feel from what's just happened in the situation and then and feel that and then move beyond as to what do I need to do. And when I think about these types of situations, they can be anything from you know, a tragic situation where we've learned that maybe one of our nurses has been injured in a serious car accident. And so the first thing you wanna think about is you think about her family, you think about the staff on that unit, but then you also need to realize there are probably 30 or 50 children that still need taken care of on that unit. And so how do you as the leader be resilient and step in and lead the group through that type of situation? Another resilient um, situation that can be negative that I'm going to bring up, and some of you um, might be a little shocked because we talked about this uh, when I, I selected the word resilient. And our speaker this morning said, how many of you have been fired? And you probably saw my hand went up. And I was fired as a chief nurse. I remember it. It was... Um, a challenging situation, you know, new leadership comes in, the new leader wants the team, and you think to yourself, my goodness, and you just need to move on. And so you might sit and feel sorry for yourself. Now that's not a five minute feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> it might be a, a day or two, a good bottle of wine might help <laughs> you through that, but also colleagues help you through it but it's how do you bounce back from that type of situation? And I'm going to be very, very honest, it happens to all of us, and for some of us it happens multiple times. But it's pulling those boots up and knowing what you do well and moving forward and making sure that the team that you've left behind 
are solid and doing all right and taking the high road. And many of you have heard me always say, take the high road, that's the most important thing that can happen. So I want to share that from a resilience standpoint, I think we as nurse leaders um, need to plan and be able to uh, bounce back but also feel what you need to feel. Mm -hmm. If it's really tough, um, I have this five minute rule. Now I know there's a five second rule, but mine's a five minute rule. I allow myself to feel like a worm for five minutes. And if you think about it, feeling like a worm isn't a real good feeling at all. And so why do I only allow it for five minutes? Because then I want to raise above and feel good about my accomplishments and what I've done and move forward from that resilience. I mentioned resilience, though, from a positive perspective. And something that I do like to share is, you know, that many of you have had that call from Magnet, where we're now a Magnet hospital and the cheers are in the room and you're feeling really exuberant and you want to enjoy that moment longer than five minutes. But you have to remember two or three days later, there's work to get done, there's patient outcomes to achieve and we need to just continue forward. And so I think resilience can be both on a positive side in those moments of triumph and then also on um, a more challenging or negative side when um, when we haven't had one of those real positive experience um, for us. Yeah, so that, that's a great way to think about um, taking um, risks in your career. And if you have that foundation of resiliency, you can do that because we know that as nurses and nurse leaders, we can reinvent ourselves a lot. Mm -hmm. And we know that without risk, there's not reward. So a lot of us probably get everybody in this room probably gets these emails all the time about all these different jobs that are available. And it's almost like um, walking through the vendor hall saying, come talk to me, come talk to me. So you've probably gotten those emails and you know, you're really an example of someone who's been in a variety of roles um, from the four walls of the hospital to outside to industry. And you know, are you, were you ever enticed by these positions that came after you and and what was and, and how did this risk play into your career and what was the riskiest decision in your career thinking about risk and reward that you ever um, really went after well I'm going to share the riskiest decision was making a decision to leave being the CEO of a hospital and to join Siemens and um, you're going to think I'm a slow learner. And in this situation, I think I demonstrate that I was. Siemens courted me for a good four to six months. And um, actually, I volunteered to interview whoever their ch first chief nurse was going to be. And I was very supportive of the role and helped write the job description but never saw myself in that role, never saw myself in that role. And I was blessed with an incredible, incredible father who was German military, so there's a lot of structure there. And um, so he said to me one day, they're courting you for the job. They want you to be their chief nurse. And I remember looking at him as if he had green horns. Because for whatever reason, I was not seeing myself lead, leave my role. I had been in it four years. I had a lot still to, to accomplish. And I just didn't see myself taking that risk. And let me go into the word risk, because I was comfortable in my role. I was at the time, and I know I shouldn't be saying age, but I was at the time about 50 years old been in hospitals since a young nurse, felt real good about hospitals. I understood operations. I understood, you know, I even understood some of the finance. <laughs> um, so it was definitely a com comfortable for me and definitely where I saw, I'm gonna say my career ending many, many years into the future. And my father said to me, what's holding you up? And I'm going to tell you, I remember it like yesterday. I said to him, well, what do I do if I don't like the job? And if I'm not happy? And he goes, well, what would you do? 
And I said, well, I guess I'd resign and call Karen Kirby from Kirby Bates <laughs> and get a job. And he said, okay, so what else is holding you up? What are you concerned about? What's, what are you feeling? And I remember this, and I'm sure some of you might relate. I looked him in the face and I said, well, what happens if they fire me? And he goes, so what are you gonna do then? And I said, I guess I'll call Karen Kirby and get a job. <laughs> And so that was hard for me to leave the comfort of a healthcare environment and go to Siemens, the third largest company, German, which I was comfortable obviously with German, uh, being a woman in a German company, being an American woman, um, and not, I mean, I did not know the landscape. And for some of you, this is going to be shocking, but I think it took me a good year before I knew what I was doing. And in the room here, and she'll probably be a little embarrassed, is Sue Lundquist. She's shaking her head, but Sue was my chief operating officer. She had been at Siemens for years and years, and she just took me under her wing, and she ran my operations and um, taught me what I needed to do, and, the, and so she's one of those giants. And the other giant was Roy Simpson, who was one of our first leaders in industry, and he was also very helpful. So I used my network, um, and they helped me through those first, um, and I feel like it was a good year. Now, I was being paid to work there, but on the other hand, I didn't think I hit my stride. Something else that I'm going to say about that um, is I didn't know how to lead in that kind of environment. So the first thing I did was put in a shared governance structure. It worked well for us in the hospitals, and so it worked well for us in the industry. But that was probably one of the um, biggest risks that I've taken. I think another risk, which I think is important, which led Siemens to want to um, hire me was some people in the room might think I'm a little bit of a gypsy, but I moved around in my various roles. So um, I was in uh, Excella Health, and I don't know whether Helen's in the room, Helen Burns. I uh, ran the uh, neurotrauma unit there, and then I went to UPMC Shadyside for their neurotrauma and got progressed up. And then, you know, I needed to be a CNO. Well, the CEO took me under his wings and said, you're a bright one. I want to teach you how to run a health system. And I was a little bit of a brat. Uh, I know for some of you that's a shock. And I can remember putting my arms over my chest and looking at uh, Henry Mordeaux, who was the president at UPMC, and saying, I'm a nurse. I don't want to learn how to run a health system. I want to be a CNO. And, you know, good man that he was, he sort of nodded and said, well, I, I'm not saying you're not going to be a CNO. I'd just like to help you understand some of the other components which was of, health, of the health system, which was important for me as our role as nurse leaders evolved. Because back then, we were only leading nursing. And so we're now, we have operating rooms, ambulatory, pharmacy. I mean, the role expanded, and he certainly had the vision and helped me um, at that point move beyond uh, my space of, of nursing. The reason I'm sharing that is I then had a tough, risky decision when I was offered a chief nursing position in Chicago, and my family's in Pittsburgh. And I was the first person in my family to move away from where we had all been born and raised in the Pittsburgh area. And it was such an impact on the family that my brothers, and I can't, and they're not going to watch this YouTube video, trust me. My brothers said, well, the children aren't going to be allowed to call you Aunt Gail anymore if you move away. Oh my. <laughs> So why am I sharing that? When you think about risk, you're going to have career opportunities that may be a state away or may be the whole way across this vast United States. 
And what I want to share with you is you are as close as an airport to get home if you need to get home, whether you're homesick, whether you need to go home for a birthday party, or whether you need to go home for that soccer game that you're there when they just pick dandelions and they don't even kick the ball. You understand <laughs> what I'm saying. But so um, those are some examples of risk. And my message to you is always have an alternative, whether it's calling Karen Kirby or whatever that might be, but look at what your options are and do go out and take the risk because it has been wonderful for me. And I was thrilled that I stepped forward and joined the Siemens team. But you, clearly you were able to take those risks because of preparation. And you know, nurse leaders really lay tracks as we go for a lot of things that we do. But preparation is also important. What would you suggest to this audience about preparing yourself, being always prepared for whatever's coming next in this evolving healthcare world? The first thing that comes to my mind is follow your passion because as you think about opportunities that come before you if there isn't a passion there or there isn't a connection it's not going to feel right um, when you when you make that change um, I think that there's other ways too. I mean, the passion for me was the first thing that I thought of. The second thing that I thought of is make sure you have the right education. And that's one of the flaws that I failed as a nurse exec if, and a nurse leader. If you see my credentials, you know I'm a fan and you know I'm an FACAG, but I never finished going to school to get my doctorate in nursing. And so when I think about planning ahead, um, I made sure that you know when my niece finished, she got her master's degree. Now I feel bad she's not a nurse, but she's in human resources, so that <laughs> helps us. But you know, the first thing she was finished, I said, before you start your family, get your master's degree. Um, and so my pearls and my comment is push forward and get that doctorate. And I'm very, very concerned about our profession. And many of you have heard me talk about this before. When, uh, when I spoke today, I spoke about um, the AONE Foundation and I spoke about nursing research and how many of us um, research what our mentors are researching or what the uh, college or university where we are studying is the areas that they're focused in. And it goes back to your passion. If you're going to be a nurse scientist, be a nurse scientist in the space of your passion. Because then it's not work. It's what it is, is you're just uncovering and creating and making a new science for us as a profession. And it's just part of your DNA versus um, replicating something that someone else has done. And so what worries me is in this idea of getting the right education is I'm very, very concerned that we've lost our PhD nurses and they are truly the scientists in my opinion. And so if we don't take a few more steps back and look at what we're doing as a profession to build the science of nursing leadership research and the new evidence, I'm very, very concerned. And I may be a little old fashioned, but I see that at a PhD level. And I'm worried about us as a profession um, on that piece. Last is plan your experiences. Um, I very, very strategically planned my moves. So when I left UPMC, I moved to uh, a large hospital in Chicago as a CNO. I knew I needed to go big because I was, where I was was big, but there wasn't any CNO opportunity coming up. So what do you do? Do you sit there and wait? You can't, you know, um, get rid of somebody. So um, especially when one of them is your dear mentor. 
and she wasn't <laughs> going anywhere. So, um, you know, so I went to Chicago strategically for a large facility there. After I um, dried my wings a little bit as a butterfly, I thought to myself, okay, I need to get to be, go to a network. And um, I want multiple hospitals. I want them in multiple states. I want to learn merger and acquisitions. And so I was looking for that next launch. And um, I found that um, with the Bon Secours Health System. And so um, I joined them. And then I was recruited to be a CEO in a health system in um, the Philadelphia area. So. I strategically moved around, and when Siemens was interested in me, that was one of the things, Claire, they talked about. They talked about I had worked in multiple uh, parts of the United States. I had merger and acquisition experience. It was fascinating that they were looking for someone broader than how I had seen myself as, um, as an individual and as a candidate. Yeah. And you're in those experiences, I think, have really shaped your career and who you are as a nurse and as a nurse leader. Um, but there's another side to life as a nurse leader because you can't be a really good nurse leader without being a really good person and having some balance. And um, I've heard Michelle Janney said it best, I think, when she said, is there really balance or is it more harmony? Sometimes you have to spend more time with your family, sometimes you have to spend more time at work, but harmony, balance, whatever you call it, how do you introduce that into your life? And don't say from retirement, because you have not balanced out so much in retirement. You're pretty much still working. And I hear people retire, especially nurse leaders, two or three times. So. How do you, and when you were working, because you traveled so much with, with Cerner and Siemens, how did you find that balance? The, I learned the balance, I, and I'm going to say this, I think it's something you can teach yourself how to balance. It's not something um, that's easy, but I'd like to start with a story about when I didn't know how to balance and how I learned it the hard way. I guess I was starting to get a little haggard and at the, um, the chief nurse was Dr. Gail Wolf and she was noticing that um, my symptoms of being exhausted were showing. And so I remember being in her office and she said to me, you just need to go home. And it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, which one of us had home at three in the afternoon? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. And she goes, no, I'm serious. I want you to go home. Your gas tank is on empty. In fact, there are no fumes <laughs> in your gas tank. You need to go home. And I said, well, I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. I'll, I'll be on my way home probably by six o'clock. No need to worry. I mean, I can remember pacifying, you know, no, no need to worry. And this is what she did. And it's something that stopped me in my tracks and also a, a leadership technique to think about. She said, no, you need to go home. And if you don't go home, I will have a security guard <laughs> escort you to your car. And I looked at her and she said, I mean it, and I'm in charge. And I thought, whoa. So I called that the bubble bath and Grand Marnier moment. <laughs> and what do I mean by that is I learned at that moment what um, having the, um, there was no fuel, it was just fumes. I, I thought on my way home, I wanted to know what that felt like so that I never put myself in that situation again. And then I had to learn, well, what's it like when the gas tank starts to go empty? And what do I do? And each one of us may have something different. It may be a manicure. It may be a pedicure. It may be watching that soccer game and then picking dandelions. Or it may be a Grand Marnier bubble bath. <laughs> where you just put a lot of fuel into that gas tank. But my pearl about it is knowing it yourself and knowing it before it happens 
and so that when you're about a fourth of a tank, you already start filling up that gas tank because we are no good to any leaders or anyone when we are on fumes. And so that's um, one of the hard things that I had to learn. But the other thing that I, was hard for me in that harmony piece is I was not a good role model. And um, you heard me talk a little bit about the evolution of my um, career. And it took me until I was a CEO of a health system till I realized what a poor role model I was. And I didn't know when to go home. I knew when my gas tank, but I also knew ways of filling it. And so what do I mean by that? I remember coming out of my office and looking down the hallway and the light of the CFO was on, the light of the CNO's office was on, and the light of the chief operating officer's light was on. It was about seven o'clock. They all had children. The CFO had youngsters preschool. The other two had high school students. Think about what's going on in high school in the evenings. And there I was sitting in my office, busy doing whatever, and they felt compelled to stay. And from that moment on, Claire, I learned that I was a poor role model and I needed to role model sending my people home at a reasonable time. And I'd like to say we always walked out about 5 to 5.30. It was more like 6. I need to be honest. But what I did is I started talking more and engaging with them about what night does your son play soccer? What night is the basketball game? And actually, I never had to get a security guard <laughs> to get them out, but I intentionally encouraged them to leave for that balance and harmony. And I need to say something, Claire, I've worked with you now for about six months. You are excellent on harmony and balancing. And I'll give you an example. We were having a 7 a.m. meeting, and it was around Thanksgiving. And Claire had gotten up that morning and was getting a Thanksgiving dinner pulled together to take to your son mm -hmm. and his hockey team mm -hmm. that was going to miss the mm -hmm. uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. So you also know how to balance harmony, and I, mm -hmm. I witnessed that well. Yeah. It's just so important. I mean, as nurse leaders, we, we, can, we can work 24-7, mm -hmm. um, but we're no good to anybody if we do that. You're absolutely right. So, um, so as we wrap up these questions, I have one final question, and it's, pertains to the Gail Latimer crystal ball. Oh. What do you see in that crystal ball that if we as nurse leaders focused on, we could elevate our profession for those who are currently serving and those who really want to take the path of nurse leadership? Um, I don't think there's one singular answer, but it, in, with your experience and if you were to look into that Gail Latimer crystal ball what would you what would you tell this group it's the the crystal ball is fascinating to me because I'm going to start out by saying this um, my grandchildren will never drive a car because they will be driverless cars when they grow up the oldest one is six second the first person to live to be 150, 150 has been born. So the crystal ball is very, very fascinating to me because it's something that if I think about in the late 80s when I was working with medical robotics, I would never have thought, we talked about a car, a driverless car, but you know, it wasn't gonna happen in my lifetime. It's just like when I think about some of the, um, some of the cancers now with yeah. genomics that we're able to treat and cancer's becoming more of a chronic disease. So as I think about the future, I think about a world where we will be preventing and predicting disease. I do believe, and I really mean this, there will always need to be nurses. Somebody is going to always have to touch and take care of me no matter what my illness is. It may be in my home. Um, it, I think we will still need some sort of a, an acute care environment. Um, I don't know whether we're ready to transplant um, 
organs at a point that we can do that, you know, on the dining room table <laughs> in the future. But I have no, um, I know it's not going to be the way it is today. Yeah. It's not going to be the way it is um, today at all. Um, but I know it's going to be very, very exciting. And nurse be, leaders are going to be part of it. We definitely will be creating it and right. part of it. Right. And it's important that we have the right academic preparation to be equal and sitting at the table as it's being created versus um, not being recognized as the mm -hmm. uh, partner that we are mm -hmm. as we create that. Um, I think some of it will be political. Um, it concerns me in, um, and I'm gonna look around the room to see who, but um, someone asked me if I was going to talk about uh, what I believe is how we're going to pay for the system. And keep in mind, at Siemens, we were in 192 countries. I've seen very, very successful socialized medicine. Very successful. And I'm not saying I aspire to that. I think Americans uh, were a little way from that. But we just can't continue at the trajectory that we're in today um, in the environment that we're in and the cost yeah. that we have. But it's exciting that we as nurse leaders have a voice in that. And I think AONE is a great opportunity to use our voice in that, in that area.